We're continuing our series of In the Wilderness, and this has been, I think this is week four, and moving through this, these stages, and I don't know as I, when I first intended to start this, that it would kind of move in the direction that it's moved, but I've seen kind of this um, progression over these last few weeks. Last week, we talked about God's provision in the desert and how that provision sometimes comes before we even go or get to the desert, that he's already at work, he's already showing us and teaching us and moving us in certain ways, and that as we are in this wilderness, God has already provided before we got there, and while we were there, he continues to provide for every need. This week, as I was preparing, another theme uh, came to light. And so this morning's message is seeking God in the wilderness. The passage we're going to be is in Psalm 63. And Psalm 63 is almost like a series of psalms, probably beginning with Psalm 60. Uh, Different scholars believe that David wrote these at either a couple of different points in his life. Some scholars believe he wrote these at at a point when Saul was chasing after him, trying to kill him. And he's hiding in the wilderness, and, he's, and God is, is providing for him in, in various ways. And, and he wrote these psalms in kind of this response to the situation he was. But also, if, as you read through these, his perspective begins to change from this inward kind of struggle of where he found himself to what God had promised and what God was going to do. So some scholars hold that that's when David wrote these. Some other scholars, at least pertaining to Psalm 63, tie this to some different events in David's life. If you're familiar at all with with David's life and David's story, you know that after he became king and he still didn't do some things right, it's said that he was a man after God's own heart. And I'm kind of like, man, how, how do you get that title when you mess up in these huge ways. But it's always in his response to realization of what he's done that he turns back to God with this true heart of of repentance and awareness of what he'd done and why it was wrong. David had some kids, and so some believe that, that Psalm 63 was written when his son Absalom rebelled to take over the kingdom. And so as a result of of those series of events, which are found in 2 Samuel chapters like 11 through 15, even through 19, it chronicles the the series of events that took place. You get this dialogue, events that were taking place, but then Psalm 63 is almost like when you watch a movie that you've read the book for, and you've read the book, and you kind of know the inner dialogue, the things that are going on in their mind. But as you're watching the movie, you don't get that. You don't get this inner dialogue. So 2 Samuel is kind of like watching this movie. And then Psalm 63 is kind of this inner dialogue, the things that are happening in David's heart and mind. And he's expressing them to God. And so whichever, whichever scholar you choose to believe, personally, I think it was probably when... Absalom had rebelled. That is when David wrote this. So as we look at this, remember, we're talking about the desert. We're talking about this time in our life when when things are hard and difficult, when God seems distant and far off, when circumstances and the situations that we're in and facing kind of seem overwhelming and we don't know quite which way to go, which way to turn, what even the next step is. Sometimes, if the wilderness is that bad, which way is even up? So put yourself in this place. And maybe for some of you, that isn't too hard. You're kind of there. So this is the setting. This is where David finds himself. Maybe this is where you find yourself this morning. And you think about these desert times, these difficult times, 
I was thinking about this this week. What's my default? What's my tendency to do in those situations? Where does my thoughts go? Where do my actions go? Where's my hope? And so, again, I'm going to be transparent with you. Because I don't think I'm too far off from probably where you are in these times either. I wrestle in these periods. I struggle in these periods. Just because I'm your pastor doesn't mean that I don't go through those times. And that I don't struggle and I don't question and I don't have periods and times of doubt because I do. And it's okay. I want you to hear it's okay. But that's not where you're to stay. And that's not where I've determined that I'm going to stay either. And this isn't just willpower that we will ourselves out of those situations. That's not it either. But in this place, in these desolate, dry, desert places, there are things we can do. And things that God gives us strength to do. What is your tendency in those times? My tendency is to kind of withdraw. My tendency is to isolate. I don't want anyone to know. I don't want to burden somebody else. I don't want somebody to think something of me that's not true. So I withdraw. I isolate. I I don't want to talk about my feelings and the things happening. What about you? See, what's unique about what the church is supposed to look like is that we're a community. We're a family. We're not supposed to go through these things on our own. We're not supposed to be isolated. I think about that and I, as we worked our way through our series in Acts, that was one of the things that just stood out to me, this community of faith. And it says that they had all things in common. So my tendency, and maybe yours, is to withdraw, to isolate. Sometimes our heart goes into this time of just distress and we can't kind of sort through all of the things happening in our heart. And it kind of mixes with the things happening in our mind and there becomes this tension of what I know is right, what I know is true, but what my heart is feeling and And we wrestle and we kind of go back and forth. Does that make sense to anyone else? Where does our mind go in these situations? It's easy to to kind of look what's right in front of us and think, "This this is horrible. And I don't see a way forward. I don't see a way up. I don't see a way out. Where does our mind go? Where does our heart go? And that's what I think is so important as we spend some time in Psalm 63 today. Because Psalm 63 reflects the thoughts, the feelings, and the response of someone that's probably a lot like us in some ways. None of us are we're king, but we went through things that are hard and difficult, situations that seemed impossible. And what's our response? We're going to read all of Psalm 63 here this morning. I didn't put it on slides because there's a lot of slides. But it's only 11 verses. I think we can do that. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 63. We're going to read all 11 verses. I hope that you're an underliner or a highlighter or someone who circles or writes notes because there's A lot to circle, underline, highlight. I hope you do that. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. 
I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing, with singing lips, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Amen. As we look at this passage, you see the distress, you understand the situation, and we see what David did. So we're going to walk through a few of these things, some things that I noticed, and by no means is this exhaustive, by no means is this the only thing that's there, but these are things as I go through a wilderness period in time in my life, things that stand out to me. And thinking about this and realizing it, as I read through verses 1 through 3, the wilderness strips away everything That is unnecessary. The wilderness strips away everything that is unnecessary. There's a lot of things we may think we need as we go through life. And we acquire things and and some of these things are are good. Some of these things are, are beneficial. Some of these things improve our quality of life. And maybe that's not necessarily what I'm talking about here is these physical things. But we hold on to things. We, we hold on to situations. We hold on to relationships. We hold on to different things that, that maybe aren't good, that maybe distract us, that maybe pull us away from the truth of who God is or what God is directing us to do or go or who he might even be calling us to be. So these times in the wilderness, if you're thinking about it in a physical sense, if I'm trying to make my way through the wilderness, I sure don't want to be carrying a lot of things with me. I have a couple of pictures of the wilderness, and and I want to kind of show you. That is a beautiful picture of the of the wilderness valley that, that David escaped to overlooking the Red Sea. But to me, that doesn't really quite depict when we think about the wilderness. However, maybe this next one does a little bit. That's the same place. And this next one of a desert that seems to go on and on and on. Those are the things I think about in the wilderness. So as I'm making my way through a wilderness experience... I sure don't want to be taking anything unnecessary with me. And so maybe the wilderness is a way for God to strip away the things that in my life that don't need to be there. Things that, that hold me down, that keep me from becoming who he's actually called me to be. Or going where he's actually calling me to go. I marvel at the, the wilderness story of the Israelites moving through the desert those 40 years and all of the things they carried with them and the ordeal it was to set up and tear down, to move and set up and tear down. I want God, as hard as, as a prayer of this might be, to strip away the things in my life that don't belong. Oftentimes, that's a painful process. And oftentimes, we resist it. 
The wilderness provides the opportunity for God to strip away the things that aren't necessary. As we read through verses 1 through 3, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. That's with intention. That's with purpose. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. If all of those things are stripped off of me that don't belong, my heart has no choice but to thirst and to seek and to long for the one that really is the sustainer of all things. You are my God. Verse 2, it says, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. I think about the things and the ways that I have experienced you. Verse 3, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I complain. Man, I complain. And here are the things that we see David do in response to this desert place. I want that to be true of me that my lips will praise him as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift my hands. That's surrender. When you sing and when you praise, it's open hands. It's not closed fists. This is surrender. This is not in the desert, I want to strip away everything that's unnecessary. Submit to Him. Surrender. As we move and look again at verse 4, the wilderness reestablishes priorities. The wilderness reestablishes priorities. We've stripped off the things that are unnecessary. Now we begin to understand the things that really matter. And I want you to wrestle with that question a little bit. We can probably come up with a church answer, uh, an answer that, that God would be proud of, but is that really true? As I go through the things that I go through, as I'm in this situation, in this desert place, is this really true of me? Is verse 4 really true? I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift my hands. No. Sometimes it's true. Because my heart, my eyes of my heart, are inward focused. They're not on him. They're not on who he is. They're not on what he said he is. They're not on the promises that he's given us. They're not on the things that he is directing us to and moving us from. They're on me. They're on my comfort. The wilderness reestablishes these priorities. Let's look at verses 5 through 7. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. The wilderness teaches us contentment. Are you content? And moving beyond the physical things. But in the wilderness, it's hard to be content. In the wilderness, we're trying to figure out ways to get out of where I am. To get to the better things. To get to things that... Because I'm so uncomfortable. I'm so miserable. And again, it's this inward focus. What is God doing here in this moment so that I can be content with trusting that he will do what he said he will do. Is that possible for me, that I can allow this wilderness time, this wilderness experience to teach me contentment? Because what if I'm there for 40 years?
Can my heart still be content in who he is? Can my heart still be content that he is with me? Do you see why we need all these things stripped away? Do, we, do you see why all these things need to be rid out of our life so we can understand the priorities and we can just be content being in the presence of the Lord? I mentioned here at the beginning of this that wilderness experiences, we just want to get them over with. And our heart isn't always in this place that, that we're okay, we're content with where we are. But number four is, kind of plays into, into action. That feeling follows action. In these places, in this time, the choices we make, the intentionality of, of what we do goes beyond what we feel like doing. Give you an example this week. There's some situations and some things in my life that seem incredibly overwhelming. I don't know what to do. And that's been my prayer. Lord, I don't know what to do. So as I was driving to this place, all of this stuff was coming to mind. And the enormity of all of these things in my mind just kept piling up. You been there? You think about this and this and this. And all of a sudden this pile just seems bigger than maybe what it actually is. But there I was driving, thinking about this pile. This steaming pile. I won't give you a further description, but you know what I mean. And I was thinking about this verse. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift my hands. So that's what I did. And I began to think and thank God for just simple things. I was thankful I had a vehicle to drive in. And just, that, that's where I started. And then pretty soon, that list began to grow and grow. And my heart began to change. And just as Patty talked about this morning, as we sing songs, those are the things that lift us up from where we are. Turn our hearts from this inward focus to who He is, what He's done, and how time and again He's proven Himself faithful, given us the promise that He is with us. This is what that looks like in that moment, seeking God in the wilderness. Feeling follows action. And I had to do it. I had to act. I didn't feel like it. I had more complaints than I had praises in that moment. But over the course of the next few minutes, that list was reversed. It didn't change my circumstance, but it did change my perspective. And it changed my heart. That's what this begins to look like in our life. In one of the commentaries, this quote struck me. True relief, meaning when we're in those desert hard places and we're looking for relief, right? True relief does not come when the problem is resolved. Because, I hate to break it to you, more problems are on the way. And that's, what, that's where I tend to think, if I can just get through this, life's going to be great. And then I have that pessimistic view, but when's the next thing going to drop? Well, this is, this is true. True relief does not come when the problem is resolved because more problems are on the way. True relief comes from an enduring hope in God's ultimate salvation. So where's your hope today? Where are you setting your hope today? (laughs) 
I don't know where this all leaves you this morning. But this is where I was at just this week. And I'm learning to trust more and more. And moment by moment of this truth and this promise that God has given me, he is with me. And that became my prayer too. I don't know what to do, but you're with me. And that was good enough. I was content in that. And the steaming pile is still there. But I know he's with me. And I'm so glad he is. And I'm learning to trust him in that. I'm learning, as we sang about this morning, to be still. So do I trust him? So there's the challenge for you today. To seek God in the wilderness. I'm going to invite the praise team to make their way up and we're going to close and I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning and we're thankful, God, that you don't leave us. We're not by ourselves. We're not in this place isolated. That maybe what our heart's intention initially is to isolate, to pull away. But Father, that's, that's not what you desire for us. I pray, God, today that you would give us the strength to take the first step, to seek you in the wilderness. Father, I pray that we would be brave enough to pray that you would strip away everything in our life that doesn't belong, that's not needed. That you would help us in this place to reestablish and understand the priorities. Help us, Father, to keep the first things first. I pray, Father, that you would teach us to be content that even if the things in our life don't change the way we would like to and in the time frame we would like to see them change, that we would be content knowing that you've already gone before us, that you are with us now, and that you guard us from behind. That we would be content in this place we find ourselves trusting that you are good, and that you're sanctifying us through and through. Father, we may not feel any of these things right now other than overwhelmed, not knowing which way to go. But I pray that you would help us to take one step. And maybe today, that one step is just thanking you. Help us today, Father. We give ourselves to you. We are in need of a Savior. We thank you that you are. We pray and we ask these things, Father, in your name. Amen.